Tonight's message is Christianity, Islam, and the woman who is on the Lord's side. I'm going to start out with a couple of uh, current events. First of all, I'm just going to read to you a couple of excerpts from a Fox News report on uh, Miriam Ibrahim. She is a Sudanese woman who has been sentenced to death. She was convicted of apostasy on Sunday and given four days to repent and escape death. The 26-year-old, who was eight months pregnant, was sentenced after that grace period expired. Muslim women in Sudan are prohibited from marrying non-Muslims, though Muslim men can marry outside their faith. The court also ordered that Ibrahim be given 100 lashes. The authorities first charged her with having illegitimate sex last year because her husband is a Christian and they don't recognize her marriage. So they're calling her an adulteress. And so as soon as she has this baby, she is going to receive 100 lashes. She has her 18-month-old Martin in jail with her right now. She is eight months pregnant. And then whenever the child, I believe, reaches two years old, she will be put to death. What's going on in our world? We're going to see. We're going to see what the scriptures and the prophecies have to say. I'm going to read an excerpt, and I actually I'm going to read quite a bit of a blog that was written by Wade Burleson, and you can find the entire thing at wadeburleson.org. Uh, the title of it is Southwestern Baptist Islamic Theological Seminary and the Center for Cultural Engagement and Firing. Mr. Burleson has been speaking for many years against the misogyny, in the Southern Baptist denomination. He is a member of that denomination and that convention and also his churches as well. But he has been a champion uh, speaking out for women's rights, specifically the right of a woman to speak the testimony of Jesus Christ. And we appreciate that very much. Um, those of us who are out here on the front lines, those of us who are the, the very few women um, who have made it through um, the, the firing line and who have been able to continue to give their testimony in public without being uh, stopped. We appreciate that uh, tremendously. We are glad that he is there and doing what he is doing. But this blog is going to bring a lot of things out, so let me read it to you, and then we'll talk about some of the issues that come up here. It says, Something very strange and bizarre is happening at Southwestern, talking about the theological seminary. And Southern Baptists should intervene before we lose our seminary to evangelical irrelevancy. Paige Patterson, president of Southwestern Theological Seminary, ordered his admissions office in 2012 in violation of the school charter and the Southern Baptist Convention's mandate for theological training to allow the admission of a professing devout Muslim into the School of Theology at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. This is a very serious issue which must be addressed by the Southern Baptist Convention. This Muslim student is a Ph.D. student from Egypt studying archaeology at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary and will begin his third and final year in the School of Theology this fall. When he finishes his studies, he will receive a Ph.D. in Biblical Studies with a major in Archaeology from Southwestern Seminary School of Theology. Dr. Patterson acts as if there is nothing wrong with Southern Baptists through the cooperative program funding the theological education of practicing Muslims. He is intending to enroll a father-son Muslim team in the near future. I find it ironic, this is Wade Burleson speaking, of course, that he fired Dr. Sherry Kluda for teaching Hebrew because she, quote, was a woman, and argued before the courts that Southwestern was a church and that the courts had no business ruling on gender roles within ecclesiastical institutions. Using Dr. Patterson's same argument, Wade asked the question, would a Southern Baptist pastor allow a member into his church who refuses to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? So, of course, Mr. Patterson is speaking out of both sides of his mouth, which he always does. The admission of a practicing Muslim who prays toward Mecca five times a day, who refuses to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and who will lead the school of theology and presumably work against the good news of Jesus Christ, is something that should concern every Southern Baptist who funds theological education with cooperative program money. Remember that. The issue is about Southern Baptist funding seminaries like Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary to the tune of $3 million annually and having a seminary led by a president who overrides the wishes of the convention and rules by fiat, not principle. Sorry, I skipped a little bit in there, but he was just saying he doesn't have a problem with Muslims practicing their faith. Of course, we want to give everybody uh, freedom of religion. We have the right to choose who we're going to serve. But he's just saying that the problem is that um, Baptists are funding this, and uh, they don't approve of it. 
So, or don't know about it. Wade goes on to say, I believe Dr. Paige Patterson's leadership can be faulted on the grounds of ethics. I plan to be in Baltimore for the Southern Baptist Convention to ask other Southern Baptists their feelings about having their cooperative program dollars pay for the education of Muslims at Southwestern Seminary. So, here we have two different stories, okay? And uh, I told you that we're going to look at what belief these two groups of people have in common. Now, a lot of you are going to start squealing, right? Because on the Muslim side of things, um, we've got you know a, a nation that is um, implementing Sharia law. They are obviously going to kill a pregnant woman just because she's a Christian and uh, give her 100 lashes right after she has a baby. This is horrific treatment of any human being, but especially uh, a weak human being in the, in the weakest, weakest and most vulnerable state, a woman who is pregnant. This is the epitome of the kind of person that we are called to stand up for and to protect, right? So it, it's horrible, and many of you who are Muslims are going to say, well, that's not how we believe, okay? Those are extremists, right? So we're not on those people's side. We, we don't believe in that. We think that that's wrong, too. Okay, in the same way, we've got Wade Burleson here, who is a Southern Baptist, who is saying, hey, you know, what they're doing at Southwestern Seminary, well, um, I don't agree with it, right? And there are a lot of us, my church, we don't agree with it. We see the same thing uh, when we saw in the Southern Baptist Church a couple years ago, First Baptist Church in Crystal Springs, Mississippi, which refused to marry a black couple uh, in their church because some people in their church complained that we're not going to have a black wedding here. Now, these people in this Southern Baptist church uh, were obviously racist. They had allowed this black couple to attend church, understand? And this black couple did not know that these people were racist or did not, you know, would not allow them to get married there until a couple of days before their wedding when some people in the church caused a big stink and the pastor, you know, he went with the pressure that he was receiving from these people in his congregation, and he told them they could not have their wedding at the Southern Baptist Church. Now, Mr. Burleson pointed out, which you know many of us know, that the Southern Baptists have uh, been persecuting women for a while. They have been firing uh, professors that are women in their seminaries. They have been disfellowshipping churches, uh, which choose women pastors, female pastors. And it doesn't matter how long uh, that church has been part of the organization, they will remove them from the organization. However, when something like this happens, they don't remove them from the organization. When a Southern Baptist church exhibits pure racism, they don't remove them, okay? They, they say things like, oh, we disagree with it, but we're going to let them work it out. But they don't disfellowship them. So you, you can see um, what is at work here. But Wade would tell you he is not a racist, right? And Wade would tell you that his church, you know, they stand up for women, which they do. So what's the problem here? The problem is we see that these two groups, they say that they're completely different, but they have something in common. And talking about the two groups that are um, doing the wrong thing, we're talking about the extreme Muslims and the extreme Southern Baptists, if that's how you want uh, to define them. Now, those are political terms. So what we want to do to find out what they have in common is go to Scripture, okay? Because Scripture is authoritative. Everything else is just opinion and politics. God's word is where we go for, um, for authority. So let's read Genesis 3.15 again. This is a prophecy that's going to tell us and, and help us to focus in on what is uh, the spirit of the thing. God is talking to Satan. It says, so the Lord God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. God placed a marker on Satan, the serpent, that he would have enmity or war with the woman always, not the man. Understand? Yes, you know, Satan's always there to, to destroy the man. But God specifically said he was going to hate women. So that's at the beginning of the book. And then we go to the end of the book, Revelation chapter 12, and we see where it started and where it ends up. We see that serpent one more time. It says, A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. You see the dragon, okay? 
His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. Okay, and then it says the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled to the desert to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. And then there's war in heaven. Satan is cast down to the earth. And it says, when the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time out of the serpent's reach. Then from the mouth of the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring. So you see that again? We've got all of the same players. We've got the serpent, the dragon, which in, in another chapter in Revelation, it identifies the, the dragon as that ancient serpent, the devil. So we're talking about the same person here. And then we've got the woman and her offspring. And it says that Satan and his offspring will fight against the woman and her offspring. It says, Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Now we're not going to get into uh, decoding this and, and saying who the woman is and all that kind of stuff, but we do know that it's the woman, okay? We do know it's a sign in heaven. And we do know that the spirit of the thing is that those who belong to Satan, those are, who are Satan's offspring, will fight the woman. So that's what you see in common here between these two groups of people. How can uh, uh, somebody who is, is such a religious denominationalist as Paige Patterson and, and the people that are, are really running uh, the, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention right now, how can these people who are supposedly such sticklers for sticking with their rules and sticking with their doctrines and, and separating from other Christians based upon doctrine, and who will not even allow a woman to teach in their seminary. Okay, how can these people stomach having a Muslim coming and studying with them and giving him an education and funding that education? How can they have fellowship? Because the spirit, you guys, the spirit is the same. Paige Patterson isn't turned off by this guy. Why? Because they have something in common. They've got a spirit in common. And what is the evidence of it? Is it in their doctrine? No. It's not. They have different doctrines. Is it in their creed? No. They both profess gods with different names, but in their actions, in their character, you can see one thing that is in common. You can see that in the Muslim world, in Egypt, where this guy comes from, you can see that it is common to have hatred for the woman, enmity for the woman, as we see that Miriam Abraham is facing, and many thousands of Christians and many thousands of Muslim women are facing. Women who are marred by acid by their own husbands who disapprove of them. Women who have their fingers chopped off because they try to go to school and their husband doesn't like it. This is enmity for the woman, ladies and gentlemen, and it is the same enmity for the woman that is at work in the Southern Baptist Convention in the leadership. It is the pervasive spirit, because it is the one that's in control, as evidenced by the fact that, though they do allow Wade Burleson to continue to be part of the convention, they do not allow any church that chooses a woman pastor to do so. So, in the Southern Baptist Convention, we see all kinds of, of things going on that, that might point uh, to Satan being at work, especially racism. But it comes into clear focus, ladies and gentlemen, and this is what the Spirit is teaching you right now. If you will look at, at the marker that God has given you at the very beginning in Genesis and at the very end in Revelation, you will be able to tell what Spirit is at work by how they treat the woman. Why? Because it is the Spirit of God that respects that gentle Spirit that gives life, the Spirit that gives birth. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit gives birth and that that same spirit is gentle and humble in nature and peace-loving in nature. Jesus taught, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth that goes against everything that the spirit of the world uh, promotes and stands for. 
Because the spirit of the world is going to take anything that is weak and vulnerable and make it its slave. And so the powerful rule, not the weak, not the meek, but in the Bible, the scripture tells us that the spirit of wisdom, who is also a woman, it is by this wisdom that Jesus overcame the evil one, that he overcame sin and death. The secret wisdom of God, by the secret wisdom of God, he destroyed the enemy because he submitted to God's plan, which was not to raise himself up and exalt himself as king, but instead to humble himself and to humble himself even to death on a cross because of this, because he listened to the woman, because he was the offspring of the spirit that is from above, as the scriptures say. He was born from above. As you see in Revelation 12, this woman gives birth to Jesus. Because of this, he was at odds with the spirit of the world, which was at work in the religious institution and always will be. Ladies and gentlemen, it does not matter what religious institution you look at, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, it doesn't matter what it is. Look all across the board, and you're going to see the pervasive attitude towards women is enmity. Because wherever you have a religious institution, you have greed and selfish ambition. When you have the, the birth of, of a spiritual revolution, many times people are idealistic. But once an institution is raised up around that, then the money gets involved. And the love of money is the root of every kind of evil. That's where the politics comes in. That's where the compromise always comes in. So, these two groups of people, you know, you may be thinking, well, the Christians are the good ones and the Muslims are the bad ones. The Bible says that God has placed his law, written it, on every human being, no matter what background they're from, whether they've heard of Jesus or not, whether they've heard of God or not. He's written it on their consciences because he created every single one of them in the form of our conscience. We have the law of God. And that law is the law that brings freedom. See, he didn't write the law of Moses on the hearts of every human being. But he did give us a knowing, an understanding deep down inside of us that it is wrong to treat another human being like we don't want to be treated. That the noble thing to do is to lay down your life for someone else. See, when we see that nobility in someone else, we recognize it. What, what religion doesn't? People from all religions, they see a hero and it inspires them. Because we know nobility when we see it. Why? Because it's written on our hearts. Different people may come to a, a confrontation with the Christ at different times in their lives, maybe even not until the very, very end of their life. We're not told that. We are told that everyone that bows their knee to Jesus and everyone who calls on his name to be saved is going to be saved. So what's important is the spirit of the thing. And whenever we are confronted with the Christ, that's when we have to make a decision. And that's what... You know, Paige Patterson has chosen, that's where he has chosen what spirit he's going to be of because he's been confronted with the Christ. He's been confronted with the scriptures. He knows the scriptures. He lies about them. He knows that the scriptures that he uses to keep women down, just like the Muslims do, he knows that those scriptures, that, that he is misrepresenting them. He knows that they have other translations. He knows that there's only one place in the Bible that even looks like it says that women can't have authority over men. And that scripture verse is inconsistent with every other scripture verse on the subject, and it has an alternate translation. But does he tell anybody that? No. Because he and the men around him who are running this convention, the Southern Baptist Convention, and who have taken pride in their takeover of that convention, these men are liars, and they know it, and that is what they have in common with everyone who has enmity for the woman. Why can he have fellowship with a Muslim? Mr. Patterson uh, published an explanation of his decision. He said that they were working with Christians and Muslims at some archaeological dig, I believe, and that this man just came to love, you know, our people, meaning these Southern Baptist people, and wanted to come study with us. The truth is that the spirits of the two people had fellowship with one another. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Whose side are you really on? Muslim or Christian, whose side are you really on? Are you being honest with yourself about the leadership that you are following, whether it's your religious leaders or the God that you're professing? Does your leader really espouse the things that you truly believe in your heart? Those of you who are Muslims and, and you hear this and you're like, you know, we would never do that. We would never treat a pregnant woman that way. That's horrible. People should have freedom. 
We are people of peace. It's time for you to become honest with yourself about the leadership that you're following because Muhammad, as you well know, his favorite bride was nine years old when he first had sex with her. And what do you call it? Consummation of a marriage? Would you call it the consummation of a marriage if it were your nine-year-old who doesn't have a choice, who's being forced to have sex with a grown man? That is called sexual abuse. Do you believe in sexual abuse? That's your prophet, man. So either you're lying about what you believe or you're lying to yourself about it. Can you be better than your prophet? Can your ideas, if they're different from your own prophet, can your ideas really be better than his? If your ideas are different from his, then why are you following him? The answer is clear. You are either lying about what you really believe to other people because you don't want people to believe that you're really that extreme or you haven't gotten honest with yourself. And that is the same thing that all of my Southern Baptist brothers and sisters who are in that convention who believe that women should have the right. And by the way, it doesn't matter who believes or doesn't believe that a woman has a right to give her testimony. She has it. She has that testimony because it has been given to her by Jesus Christ. And she has a command, a commission to speak the testimony of Jesus Christ because it is by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony that the evil one, that serpent, that dragon is overcome as we're told in the book of Revelation, and we are not given the option to be silent about that testimony. But for those Southern Baptist brothers and sisters who stand up for that truth, that women should be able to teach and preach, that women should be able to be treated as equal, that women are every bit made in the image of God as a man is, and that they are not to be subservient to all men, those of you who believe that and you are in that denomination, Mr. Burleson brought out a good point, but it's a cutting one. And that is the fact that your dollars are funding this seminary that has accepted a Muslim. Now, that is horrific to some of you because you've been giving money to the, the cooperative fund, you know, and some of that may go to this seminary. It's also, you know, supporting the entire system that you're a part of. But that system has not been influenced by you. That system was born out of the desire to keep slaves. As you well know, the Southern Baptist denomination was founded because people wanted to keep their slaves and still be able to be in church leadership. Nothing has changed today. The root was bad. The fruit was bad. The fruit continued to be bad. And now that they're no longer allowed to have black slaves, they still practice racism back in their backwoods churches where they can get away with it. And they still turn a blind eye to that racism but they can still get away with enmity for the woman. They can still win in court when they fire a professor for simply being a woman. Why can they still win in court? Because enmity for the woman is alive and well. It is the defining sign and marker of those that belong to the evil one. You see, where people will say, oh, pedophilia is bad, where people will say, oh, racism is bad, the very same people will not flinch, will not bat an eye when they see misogyny. Why? Because our prejudices run deep, ladies and gentlemen. And you who are Southern Baptists, you have been funding this. And Mr. Burleson, he wants to go and change it, and that's been his position for a long time. But the Lord is bringing you to a decision tonight. Because you've got to ask, whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? Well, I'm on the Southern Baptist side. Well, you really can't say that, can you? Because the Southern Baptists are misogynist and racist. You can't say that. But if you are funding that system that is persecuting your brothers and sisters, and yes, persecuting, if you're funding them, then are you not supporting them? And is it really enough to complain about it and to say, we need to do something about this? Well, you've been saying that for many years. Those of you who have been standing up, my, my husband is from a Southern Baptist background. He knows that it wasn't always like this. There's been a rise in enmity for the woman. Why? Because it is prophesied that there will be a rise in the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist will rise in the earth as we approach the return of Jesus Christ. This is all prophesied. We've seen a change. We've seen a campaign against the woman. Isn't that prophesied? In Revelation 12, that the dragon will be so enraged at the end 
when he is thrown down to the earth and who will he spend his rage on? The woman and everyone that listens to her teaching, her children. And what is her teaching? Well, all of her children are those who hold to the commands of Jesus. She teaches people to obey Jesus. Satan is scared of the woman because the woman is the one that is the image of the God that gives life. The image of the spirit that gives birth. And that is the image of the wisdom that defeated Satan at the cross. He is scared to death of the image of the spirit of God. We are destined as children of that woman to stand up for her. We are destined to defeat the evil one. But we cannot defeat the evil one if we don't hold to the testimony of Jesus. So we have got to ask ourselves, whose side are we on? Are we lying to ourselves? Joshua 5, 13 through 14 says, Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? Understand that God is not on your side. Wherever you're standing tonight, God is not on your side. When the servant of the Lord shows up, and you ask, whose side are you on? Which denomination are you part of? Which religion do you stand for? Which tradition do you uphold? The answer is always going to be the same. Neither. None of them. Because I'm on the Lord's side. And the Lord doesn't come over to your side and fight for you and your agenda. And the only appropriate response is the response that Joshua had. He bowed down on his face in reverence. And he said, what message does my Lord have? For his servant. We need to ask ourselves, are we on the Lord's side? We need to be listening to the message that the Spirit is bringing to us instead of thinking that we've already got all the answers. My brothers and sisters like Wade Burleson, they're doing the best that they know how to do to stand up for justice. But it is time when you see that there's no good fruit in it. It is time when you see that you are funding the very evil that you are against. It is time for you to get down on your faces and say, in reverence, what message do you have for me, God? Instead of saying, well, is the Lord on my side? No, he's not on your side. You can tell who's on the Lord's side by who is on the side of the woman. She represents everything that is weak, everything that is considered to be foolish and weak by the world, everything that is put down, everything that is made a slave. She is the ultimate image of those that Jesus came to set free and to give an inheritance and to make rulers on the earth. So you can always tell what spirit is at work there. And you've got to ask yourself, am I being loyal to the king who is loyal to the woman? Jesus said of the spirit that gives birth. And by the way, that woman in Revelation 12 is a woman in heaven that gives birth, right? Jesus said in John chapter 3, the spirit gives birth. And you have to be born from above if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said of that same spirit when people were accusing him of operating with an evil spirit. They were blaspheming not him, but the spirit that was inside of him. And he said something really interesting. He said, you can say whatever you want about me and it will be forgiven you. But anyone who blasphemes or says a word against that spirit that gives birth, that person's not going to be forgiven in this age or in the age to come. Because Jesus will take a lot from you. And God the Father will take a lot from you, and they're very patient. But you attack the person that gives birth to Jesus, and you're, you're done. That's the dividing line. <laughs> he will let you nail him to a cross, but he will not let you do the same thing to the one that gives birth to him without repercussions. And loyalty is required. You see his loyalty towards that person that gives birth, towards that spirit. But he also tells us in Matthew 25 that we have to have loyalty towards one another. Because at the judgment day, when he separates the sheep from the goats, he says to them, either you fed me when I was hungry, you took care of me, you know, when I was in prison or when I was sick, you gave me what I needed, you visited me, or you did not feed me when I was hungry. You gave me nothing to drink when I was thirsty. You did not visit me when I was in prison. You did not take care of me when I was sick. And they're all going to say to him, well, Jesus, when did we ever see you or do any of these things to you? And he will say to them, whatever you did to the least of these, my brethren, you have done unto me. And that is the message of the Lord today. Whose side are you on? Are you standing on the Lord's side? Only if you were standing on the side of the least among you. Loyalty is required. And understand that Jesus showed his loyalty 
to those that he preached to, not just by his creed, but by his practice. He didn't preach, blessed are the poor and blessed are the meek from a palace. The Bible says that he was with God before in glory. And it says that at his wedding day, it is prophesied in, in Psalm 45, that he will be dwelling in halls of ivory, luxurious palaces, where the music of the strings makes him glad. And, and it describes the luxurious robes that he will be dressed in. He comes from wealth. He knows wealth. And when he came to this earth, people wanted to make him king. He was born at exactly the right time to step into the shoes of the Messiah. And people were looking for the Messiah, and the guy could do miracles. He was in a position to live in those palaces here on this earth, too. And Satan offered it to him in the desert, and he said, nope. Turned it down. Why? Loyalty. Loyalty, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus didn't preach, blessed are the poor from a palace. He came and he lived among them. And that is what it says in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that although he was rich, he became poor for your sakes, so that you by his poverty could become rich. So those of you who are still in this system, in this Southern Baptist system, I love you very much, those of you who are, are standing up for women. And the Lord loves you, but you have to ask yourself a question. Am I really being loyal? Because the reason you're in that system is because it's working for you. That system has not persecuted you. That system has not taken away your house and your reputation. That system has not caused you to receive or be threatened with bodily harm, to be hated and despised by everyone day after day. It has accepted you. It has spoken well of you. It has provided a paycheck for you, Pastor. It has provided a retirement for you, Pastor. But it has not for the least among you. And it's particularly condemning when those that are being persecuted by the ones that you are funding are your mothers and your sisters like me. We are the weak. We are the ones who have had everything taken away from us to preach the gospel. We are the ones who are persecuted. We are the ones who have to withstand hatred every single day just because of the fact that we won't shut up about Jesus when the man walks in the room. We are the ones who have received threats and, and bodily harm. We are the ones who do not have a paycheck because we are utterly despised. And you leave us on the outside. Why don't you see very many women out there? How many women preachers do you know that are preaching against the system that persecutes women? How many do you know that are standing up? How many count them on one hand? Maybe two. I'm talking about people that are in the vision of everyone. You can name a hundred pastors just like that, that you know from your perch right now. How many women? How many? How many of them are preaching with the authority of God's word? Why? Why are there so few? Is it because, oh, well, only a few women are called? No. Brothers, I'm going to tell you the truth right now. Southern Baptist pastor brothers who love their women, I'm going to tell you the truth right now. I will give you my testimony. We are few because we have been hunted. We are few because we have been persecuted. We have heard you say from your pulpits, well, we don't have persecution in America. Brothers, I'm going to tell you right now, that is a lie from the pit of hell because the woman knows, the woman knows the wrath of Satan when she opens her mouth to teach her children to obey the commandments of Jesus, to hold to his testimony. She knows the price. In America, if you are a woman and you speak with the authority of God's word, you will be called a whore. Everything about you will be disdained. We have experienced this. You will be put in danger. Your children will suffer and be excluded. You will be excluded and kicked out of the synagogues. Why? Is it because there's no persecution in America? No. It is because we are the least among you, and you have not stood up for us because the system is working for you. How did Jesus stand up for you? Did he stand up for you from heaven? No, he came down to where you were in your wretchedness, and he took it on. He came down and became poor for you. Are you going to become poor for us, pastor? That's what Jesus is calling you to do. He's calling you to be loyal to him by being loyal to the least among you. That's your moms. How many of your moms have been silenced because they've learned how hard it would be? It's much easier to just, you know, exist in the system. How many of your sisters and your daughters were really called to be an actual pastor like you? But instead, they went into children's ministry or women's ministry. Some of them could get away with being a missionary if they, you know, pick the right organization to be part of. We are your family. 
We are the ones you're supposed to be standing up for. Ask yourself this question. Would you fund abortion? You guys are up in arms because you, you just discovered that you're funding the education of one Muslim man in one of your theological seminaries. That same seminary that you are calling your seminary and that you're taking pride in is teaching misogyny day after day after day and you're funding it. Are you as worried about that? You should be. Because they are turning out disobedient, disrespectful, dangerous young men. And I know, and I can show you pages and pages and pages of physical threats from the young men that these seminaries are turning out, these Southern Baptist seminaries are turning out right now because they write to me and they tell me what's going to happen to me if I don't shut up. Why? Because just like the Muslims, they feel that they are ordained by God not to permit any woman to speak, that they have the authority to do whatever is necessary. Countless men who go on forums and call for my death and for all kinds of horrible things to happen. I can show them to you. You want to see them? No, you don't want to see them, do you? I could tell you many stories. I could tell you many stories about being excluded. But the truth of the matter is that until you are willing to join us in that exclusion, until you are willing to take as small of a paycheck as we get, then you're not going to stand up with us and you're going to end up standing against us. Why? Because you look like total jerks when you don't, when it comes to light what's happening to us. And you're staying in your comfortable position. What is God calling you to do? You have to be loyal. You know that you wouldn't fund abortion, but you'll fund the hate of women. Pastor, would you preach from a pulpit that bans black men? Right now, if somebody offered you a really well-paid gig, I'm talking to those of you who don't believe that women should be persecuted, but you're Southern Baptist. And then you find out that that pulpit bans black people, period. No blacks in our pulpit. What would you do? What would nobility demand of you? Please tell me that you would take their check and spit on it. But y'all are preaching in pulpits that ban your mom, that ban women. Why aren't you spitting on that? Why are you trying to change it from the inside is it really because you think that you're going to be more effective? You haven't been. You haven't been. And I can tell you. And I'm one of the only voices that has survived to tell you. you. You don't see what's done in the darkness. You don't see that those guys in the white hoods show up at your door and break into your house when you're a woman that preaches the gospel and they try to take your life. You guys don't see that stuff. Why? Because we don't have a voice. We're silenced. You can't silence this one, though, boys. You can't. Because God sent me to you. He sent me to you to make you face what you are funding. Would you preach from a pulpit that bans black men? No, you wouldn't. Would you fund a school, a seminary, a pulpit, or a denomination that bans women? The answer is absolutely yes. If you don't loathe Babylon, you will share in her guilt. That's what the scriptures say. Revelation 18.4, come out of Babylon, you guys. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, come out of her, my people so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. If you think that you can fix it from the inside out, you're disregarding what Jesus said in Luke 5. He said, no one tears a patch from a new garment and sews it onto an old garment. If he does, he will have torn the new, and the pieces from the new will not match the old, and no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins and will be spilled. And the skins will be destroyed. Instead, the new wine must be poured into new wineskins. No one after drinking old wine wants the new, for he says the old is good enough. Don't you believe Jesus' wisdom? Why are you trying to change your denominations from the inside out? They're not going to change. Catholics, those of you that are against pedophilia, what are you doing? You're funding pedophilia. Oh, well, we, we don't believe in that. That's just a few priests. No, it's not. You can only see that much of it. You're funding it. Southern Baptist, you're funding the persecution of women like me. And why are you going to become guilty if you don't come out of that system? See, Jesus didn't try to reform the temple system, and that temple system was given by God. It was given by God. But he knew that you cannot put new wine in old wineskins, and he knew that you cannot take something that is corrupt, a, a, a thorn tree, and get figs off of it, or a vine that produces bad fruit. It's just going to keep producing bad fruit. That's the wisdom of Jesus, and you're not listening to it. 
And in the process, you're becoming guilty because there are only going to be a few voices that survive. And those voices are going to convict you, voices like mine. They're going to convict you of sin. And then you're going to have to find the reason that we are non-persons, that we are not important, that we are not worth standing up for, that we are not included in the least of these, my brethren. You're going to have to find a reason. And that's where you come in and you say, well, you know, she's a heretic. That's where you come in and say, well, you know, I just, I think that she's a little bit uh, angry for my taste. You, you find fault with her appearance, maybe. Maybe you think that, you know, well, I wouldn't say this from my pulpit, but she kind of looks like a witch. These are all the things that I get every day. And not only me, because I watch. I watch on the Internet as women preachers rise up and they are attacked by Southern Baptist dogs, wolves, Catholic wolves, Muslim wolves, who tell them that the woman is to be silent and they believe them. And even if they don't believe them at first, they're so beaten down by men coming in and calling them whores and hitting on them at the same time, patronizing them, making friends with them, and then telling them to be quiet. They are silenced. How do I know that it's not personal? Because I see them use the same thing on every woman, no matter what background she comes from, no matter what doctrine she's teaching, whether it's weird and out there or totally traditional, it doesn't matter. They say the same things. Why? Because it's the same spirit. And the only way that you're going to be able to justify sitting in your comfort while your own moms are suffering outside the camp is to tell yourself they're not really your moms. Jesus said, everyone who obeys my Father in heaven is my mother and my sister and my brother. You're going to have to find a reason that she's not really part of you. And so what are you going to do? You're going to become guilty because her blood's going to be on your hands too. You see the injustice and you turn your eyes away and you're going to receive the wrath that Babylon receives. Hebrews 13, 12 through 14. Therefore, to sanctify the people by his own blood, Jesus also suffered outside the camp. We must go out to him then, outside the camp, bearing the abuse he experienced. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. This is in the Bible, pastors. Do you know why I won't preach from a pulpit? I don't care which pulpit it is. Because of my loyalty to Jesus Christ, he's not welcome in a pulpit. He never was. He's not welcome in an institution because institutions are built around money and politics. And you think that you're going to change your institution, but Jesus said that you can't fit the new wine in the old wineskins. You say, well, if something's broken, it's because the leadership isn't following the, the rules of the institution. Did it occur to you? That the institution is broken. That that is the system. That that is the nature of the thing. People were banned from the synagogues. People were banned from the temple. They were put out of the temple in Jesus' time. If they confessed Jesus as the Messiah. Or if they even claimed to be his follower. And so there were a bunch of Pharisees. And there were a bunch of religious men who were secretly following Jesus. And While he was suffering, they continued in their post and even afterwards did not give it up. He was held up to shame and they were spoken well of. He became poor and yet they continued to bring in a paycheck from the very institution that killed him. Southern Baptist men, this is my testimony to you today. Your institution is trying to kill women like me. And they are more violent in the darkness than you imagine that they are. And all of their sins will come out, but you know enough to be accountable. You don't have to know all of the deep, dark secrets of Satan. You don't have to become a conspiracy theorist to know that they are attacking your mothers and your sisters. What are you going to do about it? Keep taking your paycheck, live in your comfortable house, keep your nice car, the comfort of your 401k or whatever it is that you're trusting in. Those of us who are women preachers who will not give up our testimony, we give up all that stuff. Yes, in America. And so who are your leaders? Disobedient men? Maybe it's time that you recognize that God has sent you leaders after all. And they're not the people that you're funding. The people that you're funding are persecuting them. 
I will not stand in a pulpit because of my loyalty to Christ and my loyalty to my brothers and sisters. I would never even imagine standing in a Southern Baptist pulpit. Why? Because even if they opened up to women, they're racist by practice. And I will not stand in a pulpit that is stood for slavery and that continues to turn a blind eye to it. That means that they're for it. You can tell by the actions what's really in a person's heart. I will not preach from a pulpit, you guys, where my brother or sister is disdain. If I can be part of the cool kids club, you know, as a woman, if you want to work the system, if, if you're a woman that, that speaks well, for example, if you work the system, you can get a good living out of it. If you just agree to shut up about Jesus, when the men walk in the room, don't hold them accountable when you see that there's sin amongst you. You know, just be quiet about it. Cover it up. Don't fulfill your calling. If you disagree to the terms, then, you know, you can, you can make a living. You can get on the speaking circuit and, you know, I've already got millions of views and that's without a platform. You know, I could use the system, but the Spirit of the Lord inside of me, the loyalty to the body of Christ is a fire in my bones, isn't it, in yours? Where, where is your loyalty? Doesn't it make you mad? Because I can't stand behind a pulpit that persecutes my brothers or sisters. I'll spit on it. I'll do like Josiah did. And tear it down before I'll stand behind it. What about you? This is my testimony to you, brothers. Southern Baptist brothers, your sisters are suffering. They're suffering outside the camp. Happens to be where Jesus is, and we're just wondering when you're going to join us. We'd love to see you out here, but we're not going to see you as long as you're in there because we're not allowed. And because we stand against the sin, the institutions are not going to stand for that, and you know it. So God is calling you to get off the fence today, okay? As he always does. If you know your God, you know he will always be calling you to get rid of your idols. And he is making a deeper cut right now than ever before because he is doing something in the earth that actually works. What you've been doing, if you've been trying to work the system, look around. Has it worked? No, it's gotten worse. I can give you my testimony. The misogyny is at a high, not a low. It's not working. What are you going to do? Joshua 24:15. That's what we started with, and that's what we're going to end this message with. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, stop there. Outside the camp, you decrease. Outside the camp, you don't get paid. Outside the camp, your platform becomes smaller. Your viewership might shrink. Your influence would seem to diminish. But John, when his influence began to be overshadowed by Jesus. His disciples got worried about it, and he said, no, he must increase. I must decrease. To join Jesus, to join your sisters and your moms outside the camp, you must decrease. Your ministry may get smaller. Your lifestyle is going to go down. You may not be able to fly wherever you want to fly, whenever you want to do it. You may not be able to eat whatever you want to eat. You may have to learn to eat beans and rice sometimes. You're going to have to decrease. Are you willing to do it? Or is it just words? Because if your paycheck's not decreasing, if your reputation's not decreasing to the point that it affects you where you live, then you're not decreasing. It's just false humility. This is where the rubber meets the road. So if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in the land where you're living, but as for me and my household... We will serve the Lord. We spoke to a Southern Baptist minister who is a, a pastor of a megachurch in, uh, in Kansas City, old family friend. And when we walked in the door, we were just coming to see an old family friend just to visit him because we were in town. And um, we quickly realized that he must have seen at least one of our teachings because he started making excuses. And he started saying, well, you know, this is a big ship, and you have to understand, it takes a long time to turn a big ship around. It's funny how the conviction comes out. We weren't there for that purpose. But his conviction, it came out of his mouth because he knew that they're going the wrong direction. But he started making excuses because you can't turn an institution like that around because the hearts of the people aren't with you. And, Pastor, if you can't lead your sheep out of Babylon, then you're not their leader. They're leading you. If you're the only one that goes, you better go. But one thing's for sure, no one will follow you out if you never go. Those ten virgins, they have to go out. They have to go outside the camp. 
they have to go on a long journey in the middle of the night with only a lamp to light their way. It's dangerous. They have to go out to him. But those are the ones that make it into the wedding feast. So I invite you to make the right decision tonight. And I know that this is hard, okay? But understand that those of us who are sisters and moms out there, you have no idea what we're going through. And the reason you have no idea is because you've shut yourselves off from us. Open up your hearts to the weak. Open up your hearts to those of us who are preaching the gospel alongside of you, but we're the ones that are paying the price. Open up your hearts to us, and you're going to find out that we can do so much more together than we can do apart, and that is what God wants us to be doing. Father in heaven, I pray that you would give courage to those who are listening tonight, because it is not just Southern Baptists. It is people from every denomination that you are speaking to tonight, and even some people in other religions who know what nobility is, but they're following a leadership that does not espouse that nobility. Lord God, I pray that you would call them out tonight, that the Holy Spirit would speak to them in such a strong way that they would not deny it. As their flesh rises up and makes arguments and and makes defenses and accusations, I pray that you would silence all those other voices and that the Holy Spirit, the still small voice, Lord God, that that voice would win out, that it would be the strongest and the clearest in their hearts tonight. Speak to the wives, speak to the women as they are tuned into your spirit and let them speak to their husbands and speak truth to them, Lord God, that we've got to be loyal to one another. We can't be the the haves and the have-nots. We have got to be joined together with one another in, in love and loyalty in the body of Christ. I pray that you give them courage, Lord God, and I pray that you would give them the vision of the prize that you have set out before them because for that, for that, Lord God, we know that Jesus was inspired to go through the suffering that he had to go through for us and for that kind of love and that kind of fellowship with you, we can do it too, but they need their first love fanned into flame and so I pray that you would do that all over this nation and all over the world tonight for those that are listening. Fan their love into flame so that they can see that what they are leaving is nothing compared to what they are going out to and that is an intimate fellowship with you, fellowshipping with you in suffering so that we might also share with you in your resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Until I see you next time, remember to read your Bible and do what it says.